Hi and welcome to the Steve Wraith True Crime Podcast. I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Paul Ferris. How are you, Paul? I'm fine, Steve. How are you, mate? Yeah, good to have you on, mate, and uh, thanks for agreeing to do this. We, uh, of course, got together uh, a few years ago now, uh, thanks to uh, the talented photographer Brian Anderson, um, and we put together uh, a new book, um, Unfinished Business, and that was the idea behind doing this podcast today. I, I do, Steve. Uh, never realised it was that long ago, four years ago, uh, at the farm. Uh, you remember how isolated, <laughs> isolated that was. I'm laughing because mo- most of your audience won't know, but we'll know about isolation. But being in the country, uh, not having any neighbours for a quarter mile, it's very difficult. As a matter of fact, you had described it uh, need this SAS and a helicopter and purely because of the bad road. And uh, what we discovered was a great format for recording our conversations. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, amazing that I found a couple of the old recordings only this week and, and sent you them. And um, it, it just took me back. That was the reason that I, I rang you and said, do you well, fancy doing well, this? And to listen back to those recordings, it, it gives you an insight into how a book's actually written. I, I think it was a unique, not so much a unique system, but unique to, to, to me uh, on the basis that normally when I was doing some of the, the, the books with Reg Mackay, it would take several notes, I would write several notes. And sometimes you don't get a flavour of what you write done. I think it's important that when you use uh, audio recordings, which I've used in the past to capture uh, secret uh, uh, police recordings about threats to kill and if you were to try and mention that uh, and take notes, the, your notes would be questioned, your integrity would be questioned but when you've got a recording bear in mind that if somebody's trying to dismiss that they're part of that recording, there's a facility called a voice graph analyst test that will dist- uh, dist- uh, distinguishes uh, every individual that a fingerprint that you've got a uh, an indistinguishable voice. So, it's an, Reg also called it an aid memoir on the basis that it's better to go back and, and, and revise your notes. But we took it to another level, Steve, uh, with your recordings. And I, ma- I managed to listen to the one that you sent, and there's a noisy cat in it. I, I actually thought it was a cat on another farm. <laughs> but it was in your recordings. But listening back to it, Steve, uh, it's, it's a great start, a great format. And anybody else that is probably looking towards getting anything un- anything uh, published in the literary sense, it protects both parties. It protects the author and the subject matter. Uh, it protects the author and their partners. Because if there's a dispute, or a, maybe a legal parameter, Steve, um, one of the things I was concerned about was sometimes when you write a story then you don't get an actual flavour because it's the written word that you're reading that forms that reading voice in your head to say, right, I understand, or you might not understand that. But when there's an audio recording, uh, you seem to get more of a flavour pictorial in your head towards what the actual element is. So it worked for us, Stephen. It might work for other people. It, it, it allows somebody to come in and edit uh, an audio uh, to keep and cherry pick what they need. Uh, some people are maybe a bit too long winded at times. I've been accused of that myself. But the audio in itself and what you've done, great format and a fantastic start, Steve. I think my big concern was the breakdown in communication between Geordie and Glaswegian. You know, I was wanting to touch on that, Steve, but I didn't want to go too far. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and just tightened it up as we went along with it. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously you've touched on Reg McKay and the relationship you had with him. Just just going yeah. back to those days, who actually approached who to do the book? Uh, what I know now, it was uh, Reg's wife, Jerry McKay, uh, that had promoted Reg to, to contact me. And the reason why she'd done that, because she knew some of my family from the north of Glasgow. Uh, she knew Reg was my social worker, uh, or, or probation officer, and the Black Cow, he was actually the senior uh, social worker for that area. And he, he, he delved into the past the Black Cow, what made Black Cow, what made the people in Black Cow. And he touched on uh, a topic which there was quite a few fatalities in Black Hill in the early, early 50s, early 60s, uh, with uh, locals making their own hooch, their own brew. Uh, the problem was, I don't really know all the specifics in it, but I, I want to go back and, uh, and revisit the situation that Red's never finished because I've been contacted on the basis that there has been a few fatalities. And what happened, Steve, they made their own hooch. Some people died, some people were blinded. I've got family members that want to tell the real story now. And so this might be a, a slight uh, thing towards uh, uh, a kind of a gesture t- towards Reggie's unfinished business because he was wanting to write about the fatalities in Black Hill. Uh, and, and I thought, there's a bigger book here. And it, 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 it so happened at the same time that I got a letter from Reg that was sent to uh, Franklin Prison when I was just finishing my sentence in uh, 1999. Uh, it was on my bed. It was an unusual letter. It was handwritten. Uh, I was uh, actively involved in a civil litigation against the Herald newspaper in uh, Glasgow, and in particular, the journalist called James Freeman. And I had legal advice on the basis that what they were printing uh, was a malicious falsehood because they had the actual facts in their own archives. Uh, the information I got legally was it going to cost me about £50,000 to take the civil suit towards the courts. So when I read Reggie's letter, I thought, do you know what, I need to get this out. Uh, if they want to challenge me in the book, then that will save me fifty grand. Uh, if they want to say that there's any uh, situations that are untrue, then, then they can sue me for liable because I already knew that because I was in prison, uh, serving a prison sentence, I was not of good character anyway. So uh, the civil litigation had to focus on a malicious falsehood. But that, that's what prompted uh, me to contact Red and say, all due respect, Red, the fatalities in uh, Black Hill and what you want to write about, I think I've got a bigger story. Uh, this is how I think it should be. Uh, and I await your views. What was the writing process like with Red? Uh, writing process, I'd, I'd always been writing letters for prison, but the writing process with Red was very early on the security, the prison security, uh, got involved in it. Uh, bearing in mind that I was under uh, an NI5 uh, security services investigation in 1997 before my arrest. So they follow you all the way through your prison system, Steve, and your phone calls is always monitored and recorded. Your mails maybe monitored and recorded a bit more than, than other people. So it, it, it came earlier on that one of the senior uh, prison officers in Franklin had advised me that I'm, I'm banned for contact in Reg McKay uh, through the uh, postal service and through the, the UC, the, the, the prison telephone. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it stands out in, in the books that Reg does that you had a great relationship which developed over time as well. We, we did, Steve, and how, how we ended I, I never actually met Reg uh, at that particular time. I did meet him when I was 16 when he, he'd done a, a report for uh, a, a situation I had to appear at Glasgow Sheriff Court. Reg's done a, a social inquiry background report, it was called. Um, it was obviously favourable because I got admonished. Uh, so I, I linked back up with Reg, and the communication, although we were banned uh, in Franklin Prison, there's always ways, weren't there? Reg's wife, as, as I stated earlier, was called Jerry, and I used to phone up and say, Is that you, Jerry? 
Yes, <laughs> tell the answer was asked for. I mean, to continue with the conversation, so I'm complying that I'm not speaking to Rez McKay, but I am. I'm speaking to Jerry. And in the mail aspect, it was, uh, we got some other parties to contact Bridge, and he would send in the manuscripts, a part of the manuscripts, and I would get them at the gymnasium the next day, or somebody would send them through the wing. Or, it was just a great process, and uh, covertly uh, writing uh, through Crime Book. Why did you decide to write Unfinished Business? Um, you should know that, you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was just something in which I, I had no intention, Steve, no disrespect intended to yourself or the, the, the current project, but I felt that when, when Reg passed away, that was a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a writer as such, I'm a storyteller, Reg is a writer. Uh, I was a co-author, uh, but when you touched on the fact, well, what about tribute book? Well, that's what Neil did, Steve. It's a trib- no, my book is Reggie's book. It's a tribute to Reg, and hopefully, I conveyed all the the loyalty and help and support that he gave me uh, back because that that book, Unfinished Business, will, will stand the test of time, and it's 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 Reggie's uh, testament. It's Reggie's tribute that you helped me and and. Uh, incidentally, so did Stu Wheatman. I mean, the chapters are short and punchy. Was that deliberate? Uh, I think we took a format. I think we had a general conversation on uh, what works, a long chapter or a series of short chapters. Um, if we looked at the Ferris Conspiracy book that was published in 2001, just before I was released in 2002, uh, anybody who's familiar with that book will realise that short chapters, which means that somebody's lying in bed at night, they want to read a couple of things to make them tired or, 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 or it's of an interest. It's not a long chapter, Steve. You might get four or five chapters and it's small impact and, and I think we'd, we'd be using that same format. It works for unfinished business. I'm sure you'd agree with that one, Steve. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, I I enjoyed the process, and um, you know, Stewie, who you've already mentioned, uh, you know, it, he created what we would probably call like a, a crime wall. It was like a CID <laughs> a CID <laughs> office with loads of post-it notes, if you remember. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. One of the photographs I remember, Steve, is the yellow sticky notes, got a crime scene all over these poster board, trying to piece together uh, what's relevant as threads on this book. Yeah, because it's short, punchy chapters, the book's got about, I think it's 49 chapters in all. I think my personal favourite is The Little Green Bag. And, you know, I've just uh, discovered that tape, which, um, you know, helped us put that chapter together. Can you just give the listeners a, a taste of what that chapter's about? A Little Green Bag, it's, uh, there's a song. Uh, it's probably used on the Reservoir Dogs. It's a great tune. Uh, it's something in which the, the, the whole uh, relevant aspect of the the title chapter, Little Green Bag, uh, came from an armed expedition to Rossi by what you'd call the series Organised Crime, the the Dirty Squad, the Fit Up Squad, and uh, they uh, attended uh, a premise in the Isle of Rossi on the 12th of of December uh, 1984. Uh, They were I was a subject matter of uh, of interest to them uh, for a, an attempted murder. I'd been given the keys to the flat and the keys to a vehicle by Arthur Thompson Jr. And there has been speculation that Arthur Thompson Jr. couldn't have done it because he was in prison. Well, Arthur Thompson Jr. Never, was never arrested until maybe February or March in uh, 1985. So... Whatever people try to muddy the water, this is the facts. The facts is they came to arrest me. I'm on the run. Uh, I've committed an offence. I'm on the run. I've been given car keys to, as a vehicle to get to the destination. I've caught the ferry terminal. I've landed in, in Rossi. I went to 24 Air Gale Street, uh, which was owned by Thompson Senior. Uh, and I had couple of hundred pounds survival money, not a great deal of money, Steve. I had money in the bank, I had a bank car, the bank folder, I know, like just general stuff that you would have. But my, my partner at that time, Anne-Marie, uh, was uh, six months pregnant with my eldest son, Paul. 
And we made uh, covert communications that she should come down and visit. And I, I, I was looking to be away for a couple of months, Steve, but I couldn't leave my partner that's heavily pregnant at the time. So uh, we, we arranged for her to come down. She came down in the ferry. I got on the ferry terminal. And if there was any in, any intelligence or uh, surveillance, I'd have been arrested in a controlled environment at the ferry terminal. Uh, but they never even knew Andrew was there, and it became apparent when uh, the raid took place. And there was a scene in the film, The Wee Man, where there was a, a phone call, uh, which, which actually happened, and I answered it. And uh, it was obviously a wrong number, but it was a right number, but it was the, the Fit Up Squad next to sure that I'm there. And ten minutes later, the, the doors came in, smashed in, uh, I remember three armed uh, police officers uh, taken up a variety of different positions. One was crouched uh, in other doorways, aiming the guns along the hallway. Uh, there was a clear reference, Ferris came out. Uh, so I had a T-shirt, tracksuit bottoms, uh, went into the hallway, showed them my palm in my hands and uh, just to identify that I ain't get any weapons on me in case somebody's got a, an itchy trigger finger. But... Uh, I was bundled very professionally to the ground, and the, the, the next thing was one of the police officers that was there, he was from, he was six feet six, very well built, snowy white hair, put a, a revolver right at the back of my ear, and uh, said, you know what that says, you little bastard, you get that. Just as he said that, there was a scream, there were not a female scream, was that actually uh, Anne-Marie? Uh, that unsettled everybody, uh, even, the, even the cops, they started shouting for a WPC to be present. So anyway, I got lifted from the hallway, handcuffed, put in the bedroom, handcuffs behind my back. I got a quick body search. Still, I've only got two pockets in the track, so one had a, a, a credit card folder, cut a, a credit cards on a driving license, paper driving license at a time, maybe 30, 40 quid. Nothing spectacular, Steve. Looked at it, threw it on the floor, and then they're in the, 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 the lounge talking to Anne Marie. She's a bit upset, and I'm kind of dazed as to how quick this is fucking happened, to be quite honest with you. And the next thing, this same individual police officer with a grey hair produces, produces this the bank bag, a green bank bag, and the bank bag is designed for carrying, I think it's two pence pieces, Steve. Uh, designed for carrying coins, it's not designed for carrying powder. And more importantly, even, even if you had a two pence piece on it, it would be either a lighter shade of green or a darker shade of green. But the the, the words that I use for the the, the, the the fool with the fool, George Dixon, as he, he, he used the comment, who's the brown powder, sir? Uh, and at that time it was insignificant, that comment. But it became quite relevant because, irrespective of what you put in a green bag, and that's the title header, the little green bag, is if you put a white piece of paper inside the bag, it's light green. If you put a black piece of paper in the green bag, it's dark green. So how you could put brown powder in the bag and say, who's the brown powder, son? It's a Freudian slip because he brought the brown powder with him. And he fitted me up in front of my own eyes, Steve, and I thought, this ain't fucking happening. <laughs> I know I'm laughing, but at the time I wasn't laughing, and I, and I thought, nah. And I made a veiled threat to him. Well, no, no so much veiled threat. You're sitting handcuffed on a bed with your hands behind your back. Is that a veiled threat? Probably. Uh, but he stepped the mark, over the mark, for being uh, a law enforcement agent, uh, to being a drug dealer, in my eyes. And I threatened a drug dealer, I never threatened a law enforcement agent. And the green bag became relevant and the whole court case, because I was up against five senior Starkleigh detectives who, who were renowned for uh, malpractice and corruption and fitting people up. So I was just another victim on the time scale for it. But I decided to fight it through court. I produced all the corroboration. I got an independent toxicologist, and it's all there to see. So the green bag is quite a, probably one of the most powerful episodes that I'd been involved in in my life and it was something in which I'll continuously mention it but it's been used in open court uh, the jury came back and uh, we are 
majority of verdict are not guilty and uh, severely embarrassed the fit up squad and the staff club police at that time. Great story and it's a, a great chapter in the book and uh, we did find the original tape of that so that we'll be putting that up next month. Um, yeah, we've well, got the full audio, full transcript uh, and a lot of people had suggested over the years, even in the journalistic quarters, he's not got any tapes, he's not got any transcripts. I have, Reg always said, Reg McKay always said to me, Paul, keep your powder dry and you remember that phrase, Steve, yeah. keep your powder dry, yeah, and this, because a tribute to Reg, the powder was used. It's there for uh, public examination. It's there to fact check. Uh, it's not something that we've done. And I think anybody who's investigating us are looking towards uh, any educational stuff, any criminology, sociology, and police malpractice should uh, send a, a freedom of information request to the Scottish Office for. The audio transcript, if they've not got them, what happened to them? Why are they missing? And just as well, I've got mine, because they'll bury that for... They'll, they'll, they'll say it never happened. And one of the most important aspects, that Steve, is if somebody's making an allegation towards an individual or an institution, you better make sure you've got corroboration. And this is the first time in my life I didn't need to say anything other than the fact to allow the readership to act as a jury to find their own decision to say, do we believe this? Who made the recording? It was done in this circumstance. There's the transcript, there's the audio. And for them, to, for me, basically, they produce the goods and say, there's my corroboration. I'm not saying any more. Listen to that. I might be accused of a lot of things in my life, but I've never been accused of 